of other manifolds. The pain by not surgery. quite an interesting fact because uh, so th these were always the canonical examples of things that you should look at that would right the, th the theory being that you know, what a this was understood even in the days of Donaldson theory I think that um, the, the invariance of these manifolds somehow C pi one of the knot that you put in right so the dogative surfaces related to the triplet knot for example um, and so, so the, I think there was a philosophy that um, you know maybe you shouldn't be able to get away without having some one handles in these manifolds, but that's, that's just not true. Um, so, uh, I think this, this remains quite an interesting question, but I don't know how to solve it. Okay, so um, uh, enough about my inability to answer this question. So uh, let, me, let me talk now about um, why the theorem is true, um, because I think it's uh, sort of in the theme of the conference. So suppose that we have a uh, four-manifold that's homeomorphic to S2 times S2 and only has even handles in its decomposition. So that means that M is a zero handle and a pair of two handles and a four handle. All right, so if you were to draw a Kirby calculus picture of this thing, it might look One knot, here's another. Um, we've got two framing coefficients, A and B. So the linking form is given by ABLL, where this is just the linking number between the two components here. And since it's homeomorphic to S2 times S2, this is equivalent as a quadratic form to the standard hyperbolic form. So what does this mean? This means that it's all, actually you can slide handles um, to get to this hyperbolic form. Right? That, what, what does it mean that these are equivalent? It means that you can sort of change this by sort of elementary transformations in SL2Z until you get to here. Um, and every elementary transformation in SL2Z is just a handle slide over here. So. So I can slide handles um, until I can assume that A is B is zero. Okay. Um, and so now let's just draw a picture of what our four manifold looks like. Um, well, we started off with a four ball here, maybe just for decoration's sake. Let's say we have a yellow four ball. And then I attach a two handle, let's call it H1. And um, then I attach the other two handle, which maybe I'll imagine is blue instead of yellow. That's H2. And then on top of the whole thing, I stick the four handle, which is another four ball. And I, I've, I've drawn this picture schematically because I want to chop um, the manifold up in exactly this way. So. Uh, what does the picture look like? Um, looks maybe something like this. So off here I've got the four ball, and down at this end over here I've got another four ball. Um, and in here I've got the first handle, and in here I've got the second handle. Um, and let's call this boundary component N. And uh, all of this stuff here, let's say, is W1. It's really W1 is yellow. And, um, W2 here is blue. Um, so in other words, what do we have? We've got uh, 
W1 is, well, it's B4 union a zero frame. is exactly the same thing, so maybe I'll just call this WI attached along a not KI inside of S3. Okay, and so um, the boundary of W1 is N. Um, since this is a zero frame handle, um, remember we slid the handle, so this is uh, this is a homology. S1 times S2, and uh, the boundary W2 is uh, in bar. Now, can I continue carrying on out indefinitely in this direction, or does it get sort of too far? Should I, st should I stop here-ish? Okay, maybe, maybe let's have one more little more bar. Um, so, what's, uh, what's the first thing that you should think of when you do this? Um, is maybe, uh, let's just take um, W2 is W1 with a reverse orientation. Okay, so in other words, um, I can take K2 is um, K1 mirrored. Okay. So zero surgery on the mirror knot gives the mirror orientation on zero surgery here. Um, so what happens then? So then M is a double of um, W1. And as anyone who's ever read their sort of curvy calculus knows, that means that uh, actually M is S2 times S2. Um, and of course, the Ojeva Sobel invariant of this thing is zero. Um, uh, you know, in some sense, the, the, the theorem is, is not much more complicated than this observation, um, that's a little bit, but uh, so uh, you know, but, uh, let's let's just note um, that it doesn't have to happen this way, right? So in fact, so uh, w in order to make a manifold like this, what I need is I start with some knot and I do zero surgery on it, and then I want to find another knot whose zero surgery is the same manifold. Um, and in fact, it's well known that there are plenty of those. Um, so I think uh, you know, the first examples were found sometime in the 80s by someone named Brakes, and then um, a student of John Lukey's named uh, Osanak, or I, I'm going to mispronounce his name, showed that you, know, you could even find infinitely many different knots with the same zero surgery. Um, so the, you know, there, there's a fair amount of room for potentially constructing examples here. Um, it's maybe worth asking. Um, so, is such an M always homeomorphic or okay, always diffeomorphic to S2 times S2? Um, so, the, you know, the theorem says that you, you certainly can't tell it apart. S2 times S2 from its Oshkosh Sabo invariants, and therefore almost certainly from its Cyber Whitman invariants and the like. Um, okay. So now, um, I guess we should talk a little bit about what the Oshkosh Sabo invariants are, since this is kind of a mixed crowd. Um, Associated to three manifolds, we have some groups, Hagar four homology groups, HF plus and minus. Um, and the first thing that I want to remind you of is that um, so if I have a cohortism W from N1 to N2, um, so in other words, that means that the boundary of W is N1 with the opposite orientation is doing. 
Then there's an induced map, let's just call it phi plus or minus a w, um, which maps this Fleur homology group hf plus minus m1 to hf plus minus m2. Um, So th these maps satisfy a certain duality property that it's nice to understand. Um, so notice that I could as well think about this as this is N1 bar bar disjoint union. Um, N1 bar disjoint union and N2 bar bar. Um, so there's another cohortism which is called W opposite from N2 bar to one bar, which is exactly the same oriented um, four manifold. So it's important to notice that I didn't change the orientation of the four manifold when I did this. I just sort of changed my opinion about which end was which. Um, and so then I have maps um, by plus minus uh, W of. Um, so this maps from HF plus minus plus minus and one um, oops, bar and bar. And now uh, the, these groups here are more or less dual. So of course they're not really dual, they're just dual at the chain level. Um, so there's a duality map here to the dual um, so HF minus plus N2 dual. Plus of one dual. Um, and the map that makes this square commute is really just the dual of this map over here. This is phi minus plus. So turning around the cohortism just means that you dualize maps. So I conveniently kept my picture over here. Um, so what, what is the Ushva-Sabo invariant of this manifold here? Um, it's uh, well. Um, I look at. Uh, I'm going to sort of abuse notation and call this part of the cohortism here W1 as well. Um, and uh, I guess I'll call this part of the cohortism W2 op, um, since I tend to think of W2 as looking like W1. Um, so this is really what I get by applying um, phi plus on W2 off, composed with a certain projection map. So, back, everyone here is so young, probably no one except for 
Tom remembers the days of cyber wooden theory, but um, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing when you're the sort of second oldest. Uh, I was, I wasn't, at least I wasn't around when Donaldson theory was. Uh, <laughs> right, but um, okay. So in Zucker Witten theory, there's a sort of well-established um, theory of wall crossing, right? And um, you know, I don't think ever, anyone has ever written it down in Hagar floor homology, but presumably there's a wall crossing um, in Hagar floor homology as well. It depends on so the choice of this homology class, is, which is not a sort of class with positive square, but rather one in the boundary of those classes with positive square. Um, and in this case, the, the, um, there, are so few, there are so few classes with square zero that you actually don't need to even need to worry about this wall crossing issue, because there are, I mean, there are only two classes with square zero in this manifold. I mean, the homology is two-dimensional, but they're just sort of two lines that you Either one will give you this the answer you want. Um, okay, um, but yeah, this is this is not quite the standard definition for when p two plus is positive. Um, yeah. So are you are you using cyber theory theory secretly? Or are you using no, 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 I'm using Hegar floor homology. Okay. This is you you can go off and read Peter Peter and Zoltan actually wrote this down. Uh, okay. um, not the part about the wall crossing, but I'm not using. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so uh, just to, yeah, a few comments about this formula. So th this, um, this map, this is some, I'm not going to say so much about it, but this is a map from um, HF um, minus N to HF plus N. Um, I, you, you should also ask me about twisted coefficients, but I'm going to sweep that under the rug as well. And uh, so, the, the, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that the, this map is basically an isomorphism, except in the zero spin C structure, actually. Um, you know, it's more interesting in the zero spin C structure. But from our point of view, it's just some map. Okay, and now, after I do all this, what do, what do I get? Well, I started with one in here, and then I, then I got something in HF minus of um, N. And then I hit it with this, this map here that took me to HF plus. And then, then I wound up over here in HF plus of S3. That's what this map did. And here really, so I should really hit this whole thing um, with one more projection map, um, which takes me, it takes sort of one in HF plus of S3 to one and all the sort of new inverses to zero. Um, so, but, I mean, this is an awfully inconvenient expression. Um, it's much better, I think, to write this as, um, to just use the, the duality here. And the fact that this projection here is basically just dual to taking 1 in HF minus of S3. Um, so another way that you can think about this is that it's just, um, so the pairing of phi minus W2 of 1 with this projector pi minus plus of pi to pi minus um, w1 of 1. Okay, and again, again away from torsion spin C structures, this is really, you know, this projector is not doing anything. This is, um, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, I should be, is the answer. What's the remark? Um, the, so, you mean, what's, the, what's my answer? What was Tom's question? What was the question? Why, why am I calling it a projector? Of course, I shouldn't be. Um, I, I want to call it an isomorphism, but no. All right. But let's not worry about it. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, in fact, um, another way that you, you might want to just think about this is th this thing here is really just the relative invariant of um, this this four manifold with boundary here. Right. So what this is is it's a pairing of relative invariants. Um, and, uh, so this is sort of OS of W1 paired with OS of W2. Um, and uh, of course, b before Ushoff and Zappo and Kronheimer and Rufka, everyone, so this is how everyone thought about uh, 
floor homology, the, you know, then they taught us that really that's not quite right. Um, but the, uh, oops, and I forgot. In fact, actually, what we'll do, um, so it's enough to prove that one of these two pieces is zero. So either um, OS of W1 is a zero invariant, or OS of W2 is a zero invariant. Right? And then, if you know that, then this has got to be zero. Okay. Um, so, in other words, we've really come down to sort of quite a simple problem. We're looking at this four manifold right here that I get by starting with a four ball and attaching a single two handle along it and trying to compute that relative invariant. And that's um, all we need to think about now. And so, This was sort of the whole original point of non floor homology. Right? So, um, so OS of Y um, can be computed from sort of non floor homology if it's not that I did zero surgery on. Just sort of recall how that story goes. So, I'll uh, say a word or two about spin C structures first. Right, so. H upper 2 of n is isomorphic to H upper 2 of W1. Let's just think about W1 now as Z. Right? So that means that I've got an integer's worth of spin C structures to think about. Um, so let me say that phi i is the map from H at minus of S3 to um, H at minus of phi. Uh, spin C structure SI, where C1 and SI is Y. Um, if it, you, know, you come from the, those people in the conference who don't think about spin C structures, um, then don't worry about it. Uh, spin C structures are almost the same as H upper 2. In this case, they really are the same as H upper 2. Uh, we're just saying that this map breaks up into a direct sum of maps uh, labeled by integers. And there's a well-known symmetry that says that uh, well, this thing here is isomorphic to HF minus and S minus I. And of course, um, the map um, P minus I is more or less the same map. Maybe this only commutes up the sign, but let's not worry about that. So what we really want to do is understand these maps phi i. Okay, so let's make a statement and then have a little example. Um, so the statement is that uh, CFK minus K um, has some natural subcomplexes. Let's call them CI inside of CFK minus K. Okay, and so well, let, let, let me draw a picture of what these sub subcomplexes look like. Um, in the case of the 2,5 torus, 
you know, if you understand this story for the two five Taurus lump, then you, you understand it for almost everything. I feel. Um, so here's the knot floor homology of T two five. Um, it's five copies of Z. So I'll draw a height here to indicate the Alexander grading, or equivalently the sort of power of T in the Alexander polynomial. Um, and so, of course, you know, naively, these are just groups. But really, uh, the most important thing about the knot floor homology is that it's groups with differentials on it. Right? There are differentials on these groups, which look like this. Okay, and when you take homology with respect to the differentials, you're just finding HF hat of S3. Okay. Um, so, now, let's see what these subcomplexes look like. Let me first draw um, CF minus K. And so I'll, instead of writing Z's, we'll just draw dots. So let's take, here's a single copy of um, this thing. And now I, I multiply this by a sort of full power series ring or polynomial ring, depending on your taste, Z of U. Um, so I'll draw that this way. At some point, I'm going to have to stop. But of course, this process continues on forever down in this direction. And this chain complex here, well, let's see these differentials here. Um, picture it's clear that the action of U is carrying me diagonally down into the left. So this is one generator and this is U times it and this is U squared times it. Um, but in this story we also have sort of differentials that can go like this as well. Um, indeed we do, they look like this. Okay, so this is what this complex looks like and it just carries on forever in this direction. Um, and uh, so what are the um, what are these complexes? Yeah. I, I hope I haven't screwed up. Usually, as those of you who know me may be aware, I, I usually draw this picture sort of 45 degrees to everyone else's uh, picture. In a particular 45 degrees turn to this picture. Um, so I, I hope I haven't screwed up doing it. Can, can all, all you normal people out there give me? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> And so what, what, what do these C's look like? Well, I mean, I just, I just lop off the top so much of this complex. That's all I do. So for example, this, everything below this red line is C0. Forget about this, and everything down here is in the complex. Everything below here is C minus 1. Everything below here is C1. Because the whole thing is C2, and so forth and so on. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, what do, what do you do if your groups are big and complicated and instead of just Z's in every one of these? Well, you, you, you just you, you take this group here, which is, you know, some group at not for homology, and you call it a dot, and you draw it here. And it looks, the picture looks exactly the same. Um, so <coughs> nothing really changes so, in this story. Okay. Um, so these are the natural subcomplexes. And uh, so now the next part of the story you can phrase in a couple different ways, but I think the, the geodesic one is to consider um, the chain complex Mi, which consists of um, Ci together with a map to um, all of well, let me write this is CFK minus K, but of course this is also the same as CF minus S3. Okay. Well, this is a chain com complex built out of two pieces. Um, and I have to tell you what the map between them is. And the, the map, well, there's an obvious map here, which is um, the inclusion. So 
let's say that um, Yoda I has CI besides U to I. And that's reflected in the fact that there's a symmetry in this picture, um, which is just conjugation symmetry. Okay, so you'll notice that if I take C1 here, C1 is everything below the sort of yellow line. Um, it's actually exactly symmetric the C minus one, which is everything below this green line. If I reflect, um, and here, here's where I feel my, my, my angle on this thing is more convenient, but I, I need to sort of reflect along some line here. Okay. Um, so there's a natural symmetry in this picture which exchanges the short leg here with the short leg here, the long leg. And that's the conjugation symmetry, C mapping from Ci to C minus I. Okay, so the, this map between these two complexes is a sum of yoda I plus um, yoda minus I composed with the conjugation symmetry. Okay, 
And so, in fact, if you think about it, this map is sort of always surjective, sort of in, in very low degrees. So, the, in fact, what it does is it sort of it hits some power, but now it's not like a few coefficients, so you don't have to worry about divisors and things like that. Um, so, it, you know, it hits some power of u and every power of u after that. Um, and it you know, misses some powers of u before. Um, and, and the thing to notice here is just that. Hi plus 1 is always less than or equal to Hi. Um, and that's because uh, take the inclusion of a smaller complex here, it factors through the inclusion into a bigger complex. And so now, um, Now we're, now we're almost done. I know this is a slightly long computation, but um, what, what do we need to do? Um, so we just need to look at what the what the image of this map here, here is in here. Okay. And since we're working with a power series ring, um, so. Co-kernel of yoda i plus yoda minus i equals to c is actually just going to be the smaller of these two numbers, h i and h minus i. Okay. Um, let's hold on to the, what happens at h zero just for a second. All right, what? Um, so in other words, but you know, h i plus one is always smaller than h i. So this is another way of saying it's um, just h of absolute value of i. Okay, so when i is positive, it's h i. When i is negative, it's h minus i. Um, how do you know that they don't cancel? Ah, good. Right. So of course they do cancel. Um, Exactly in the case when i equals zero, right? And so then that's yeah. So th this is why we should put a minus sign here, right? Because um, in fact, what really ought to happen in the homology of um, <coughs> the zero spin c structure is that both of these things ought to survive, um, and um, they do. Okay. In fact, that is what happens is these have the same degree and they cancel out. Um, and so, when I'm thinking about the zero spin C structure, I better work with twisted coefficients, right? And then these don't cancel out, and everything more or less works the same. In the, in the case when I is um, not zero, right? Then, um, in fact, what I see is that one, one of these numbers is actually sort of strictly less than the other, and so they don't cancel. Because this this C map actually, if you think about it, it lowers homological degree, um, mapping from uh, you know C positive number to C negative number. So that means that you know, this thing, the image of this thing, is in a sort of strictly higher homological degree than this thing, so they can't cancel it. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, to summarize, I mean. We, we did some algebra, but at the, at the end of the algebra, um, the uh, so see is that the dimension of the image of I is the same as the dimension of this co-kernel, and um, that's just the, the single number HI. Okay, so the, these, the image of these maps is, is completely controlled by these numbers. So, so the twisted coefficients were forced on you much earlier in the story, right? <coughs> so you to define the four manifold, right? Um, the, yes, that's uh, that's right. Um, yeah, the, so well, and you want each of them to make advantage. Yeah, I mean, so. It, 
in truth, if you wanted to, you could get away with them without them at that point, because the spin C structure in which the four manifold invariant might be interesting is a non-torsion spin C structure, and so you know you don't actually need them to compute the one that you're interested in. Um, but uh, you know you, you probably ought to think about them anyway. Okay. Um, so just to summarize.
integrating is one half mod two. And um, survives um, under u to the k for all k. All right. So in other words, um, the, this, is, this is still a terrible definition, right? So what you should think is that um, hf minus n looks like two copies of z of u. Um, Plus some portion in U. Okay, and one of, one of these copies has absolute grading congruent to a half on mod 2, and the other one has absolute grading congruent to minus a half mod 2. And you're, you're picking out the grading of this element. And what, what it always is, is it's always this thing here is just remember we had this mapping from MI to. Three. Okay, so the, this this element here is really just the z of u sum n in this ci. Okay, and that's that's why this is um, the same. Okay. Um, so now, uh, now at this point we're we're really just about done. You see, we, we sort of really know um, we can really tell uh, when. Surgery on a knot gives us a non-zero invariant. Okay, so now let's just go ahead and prove the theorem. Prove the theorem. Um, somehow the key point is that we can we can characterize this both in terms of the three manifold that we're looking at and, and in terms of the knot. So, well, suppose, suppose I tell you that the relative invariant of both pieces was not zero. Um, okay. Then, then that means, so we just, so we just look at this list over here, and we see that um, that means that tau of k1 is bigger than zero. Um, and uh, so, what we'd like to what we'd like to do is we'd like to look at this list and say that means that you know it also means that tau of k two is bigger than zero. Um, but uh, that's somehow not so helpful. So instead, we look here and we say that um, it also means that um, d one half of n bar. So now we apply this criterion here um, is less than a half. And uh, now, no, no, what do we do? So now we know. Um, so we go back and we think about our double, right? In the double, we um, we really use k1 bar. Right, so k1. So note that um, k1 bar zero surgery really is n bar. Okay. Um, and on the other hand, we we know that. Um, we have this thing that we can recognize in terms of n bar. Okay, we know that we know that this thing has a non-zero invariant, but that's that's equivalent. This implies that actually that um, tau of k1 bar had to be bigger than zero. And now we're really in trouble, right? Because um, tau tau of k1 equal to tau of k1 bar. Um, so this just, oops, no, minus tau of k1 bar. Okay. Um, so, this, so this just really can't happen. Um, so it can't be the case that both of these invariants are just not zero. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. Um, it's still a disappointing theorem, I have to say. Um, so I'm sorry about that. I should learn to compute fundamental groups more carefully. Okay, so I'll stop here. Yes. I was looking.
confused as to why we need a tau in the, I mean, because d one half of n bar is like, ooh, my no, 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 you got to be careful, right? Because d one half of n bar, when I reverse, we get to, yeah, so when I reverse orientation, d minus a half. Yeah, it's d minus a half, and there, so there's no condition in here on. Uh, well, well, but d plus one half should be greater than d minus a half because of the action uh, h one of homology. Right. Let's see. So, um, I mean, I'm probably going to say. Yeah. Uh, no, maybe. I mean, I tell you this. So, uh, I'll tell you that it was the, the last time I really thought about it was three years ago. Um, but at the time, I thought that I could. I, I tried. I tried this argument, and I, and I thought there was something that I didn't like about it. Um, but uh, so then, let's talk afterwards and decide whether whether, you know, whether it's purely a phantom or not. Um, so is tau determined by the zero surgery? Um, so is tau determined by the zero surgery? Um, so, just by the zero surgery itself, or by the maps? Yeah, by the zero surgery. By the zero surgery itself, I don't really see. Um, I don't see off the top of my head um, how. Right. I mean, somehow I'd like to. I mean, what I what I really like to know is, I, you know, I look at the floor homology of the zero surgery, and um, I'd like to be able to say that. Um, you know, some of that stuff in the zero surgery was hit, um, you know, under the image of yeah. So I mean, I, I don't see why you could say that. Although it seems like it seems like kind of an interesting question. There's certainly leeway. I mean, there's certainly leeway in the exact triangle, for instance. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of leeway. Maybe, maybe secretly, secretly it is the term. I mean, I, for example, I don't, I, you know, I, I can't think of an example of two knots where I think they have different, uh, uh, different tau, but the same zero surgery off the top of my head. So there's this conjecture that the zero surgery detect or determines the concordance class. So if that were true, it would certainly imply the tau's are the same. But, uh, okay, but. Uh, Okay, so in other words, I shouldn't be able to think of an example. Well, I think it depends on if you. Probably that means I should be able to 